that brings us to our presentations by the PGE or by PGE. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. President. I don't know if that speak uh, the mic's on. Sure. Mr. Oh, President, Commissioners, on? Mark Krauss with Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, rather than do a presentation as we've done in the past, uh, I think you've seen a couple of those. I want to just touch on some of the points that were uh, mentioned this morning. And yeah, you've uh, got to give your name and, and your organization for Mark, the record, please. Sure. Mark Krauss with Pacific Gas and Electric. Um, I want to start by um, sort of putting it in some context. I appreciate uh, Commissioner Sutton's comments in terms of why we're here, why PG&E is being required to do this. Um, we have had a very robust uh, long-term seismic program for the history of the plant and just before that, you know. Um, I think many people know the history of the plant. There was some discussion about building it to the south, studies of that area and, and known faults caused not only the move of the site up to where it currently sits, but also a retrofit to uh, be more seismically robust when the Hosgree fault was discovered. So pg and has been doing uh, seismic surveys for, for over, I think we're past 30 years now. Um, we use a variety of technologies that include, have included in the most recent past, low energy 3D surveys, um, 2D surveys, uh, a number of other technologies, and felt that that was sufficient when uh, assembly member uh, Sam Blakesley, who represents this area of the coast, came to the legislature with a bill, AB 1632, and said the CEC should study this and determine really what are the vulnerabilities for both of the, the uh, nuclear plants. And in the course of that study, it was determined that 3D seismic technology, high energy technology, should be used. And part of what informed that was um, both uh, Mr. Blakesley's experience in the oil industry field and our local assembly member, uh, pardon me, our local uh, supervisor, Bruce Gibson, who sits on that independent peer review panel you heard about that the PUC has formed. Um, Supervisor Gibson also feels that this is the appropriate technology. So as people have asked, you know, is there something else you could be using that's less harmful to the environment, that kind of thing? I think we're talking about a weighing here. First, the importance of getting this data, and second, what is the environmental impact? So first, on the importance of getting the data, you know, let's talk about that technology choice. Um, the analogy that Supervisor Gibson uses, and he's a geologist, so he was selected not just because he's a local elected in the area, but he uh, formally did this in his academic career with Rice University. It's been a number of years, but um, he uses the analogy of, you know, we're currently using uh, an X-ray, the equivalent to X-ray technology, and for looking at some medical question, and this is really the MRI technology. I think he's even said whatever the latest, I'm not, uh, don't have that background, but whatever the very latest on that is, this is akin to that, that we need to use high energy 3D because it gives you that additional layer of uh, understanding. I know that NRDC, and that's why I mentioned the, the balancing, that is certainly the crux of NRDC's comment letter, um, saying the additional information you will pick up from this does not justify the environmental impact. Um, so those who specialize in this area, Supervisor Gibson, uh, Assembly Member uh, Blakesley and others, believe that it is absolutely appropriate to be using this technology to get that additional air. Um, that in particular after Fukushima. I mean, can we tell you if you're worried about a tumor, you know, that, that an x-ray is good enough and we just don't feel that's that we can tell our residents in the Central Coast that 2D or low energy rather technology is good enough. Um, now on the environmental impact, the, this very same ship using this very same technology was used just recently up off the coast of Washington, both in state waters and out in federal waters. There was, according to our, uh, well, we're dealing with all the same contractors, so they were, some of them were actually on the ship. No take of fish, no take of uh, mammals. So, uh, Commissioner Rogers, I know you've asked, are you telling me there's not going to be any take? Uh, we have not said that. And I want to point out that the, the draft scientific collecting permit you have before you says no take of adult fish. We don't believe we can operate under that condition. I'm not sure we'd go forward with a zero take approach. We need at least a de minimis level if the prop on one of the many boats were to strike a fish. I mean, that's take, not, not caused by the sound source, but so I really mean de minimis. I'm not talking about, you know, a little loophole that we can get a lot of take in. I mean in the handfuls. Um, so we're negotiating with the department on that, but that really is, is more to do with the activity of the project itself than this technology. Um, so I think that covers uh, some of the issues that were brought up this morning. Um, Commissioner Sutton had mentioned the many agencies that we've gone through on permitting here. State Lands Commission, Coastal Commission, you've already heard about. Coastal will be up on October 10th if, uh, 
things go well if we if we're able to move forward um, as you know yourselves the commission and the department the Department of Parks uh, because of uh, right of entry permits and of course the county and then on the federal level you've heard from US Fish and Wildlife NIMPS and the Army Corps um, for a nationwide permit on that um, there was also uh, the question about what kind of monitoring we're doing and why would this be different from some previous projects we do have substantially higher levels of monitoring requirements um, rather than just one uh, scout boat we've got several at least at least two to my knowledge and and maybe three aerial surveys and this is very important uh, that's one of the key parts of our mammal monitoring program we're required to do surveys under the Coastal Commission and I think Fish and Game and the Commission may have been involved in this back in the 90s under the standards for HES high energy seismic survey guidelines they said you do aerial surveys before and after your work. Under this permit, as state lands uh, permitted it, we are, it's conditioned on our doing aerial surveys weekly. Those surveys have to go eight miles beyond the boundary of our project. And if we come within, if the ship is coming within 1.1 mile of any mammal, not just a marine, not just a listed, but any mammal, we have to shut down. So, and, that, and how do you know that, Commissioner Sutton, I think you asked, because of aerial surveys and because of boats that are, that are out in the waters. Um, so those are just some of the protections um, you heard uh, from the federal permitting agency, so I won't repeat those. Um, what we heard last time we were here from Commissioner Rogers and, and all, I think all of you was, okay, that's mammals, but we care about fish. And we explained to you that we're working with and, and are in, uh, if we're not in contract yet, it's very soon and we're gonna be spending substantial amounts of money with uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo to do what um, we had mentioned last time, the catch per unit of effort surveys where fishermen, local fishermen, will be out before we begin our surveys, while we're doing our surveys and after to measure the difficulty, that unit of effort in catching fish of, many, of all species that, that they're encountering to determine if we've had an impact on that. I know Commissioner Rogers, you said you weren't satisfied with that. That wasn't good enough because it touches such a small quotient portion of the of the populations. So we're also doing those remotely operated vehicle surveys. And um, Dick Rosen is here from uh, Marine Applied Research to give a presentation if you'd be interested in that on those ROV surveys to get you more uh, detail on that. Um, and then we're also doing uh, some trapping also to determine again before, during, and after what our impact would be. So. You know, we've given you anecdotally that other surveys around the world have not had impacts like you're concerned about, but we're also saying we will be monitoring uh, throughout the project. Um, other areas of monitoring, we're, we're more than willing, although we haven't been able to engage with the department yet about, or the commission about uh, marine protected area support to financially support those, those uh, nurseries to make sure that we can ensure that, that any, any good work that can be done there, we want to support that as well. To put things in context, and I don't mean to be so crass, but we've, we've got about a $64 million project here that was funded by the PUC. I, I, I think these numbers now are beyond that. They may very well be beyond that, but that's to do the work here um, just to hire the boat, do the surveys, uh, crunch the data, and determine what the seismic threat is here. Maybe over and above that, but what we will be required to spend. Last meeting, we were at about $6 million in monitoring alone. Not mitigation, but monitoring alone. So those CPUE, the, the various federal requirements, all the work we're doing. And as of today, we're just a little north of $8 million. So out of that $64 million, and maybe beyond that, a huge amount of that budget for the, the, what we had intended to focus on here, the seismic work, is going to be for monitoring. Um, I, I know there were some other questions and I don't want to just rattle on. If I haven't covered something, I'd be glad to uh, respond to any question. Mr. President. Commissioner Sutton. Thank you, and thank you for being here again um, <coughs> to uh, address this uh, important set of issues. Um, to continue your medical analogy, since you uh, cited that. Uh, we have a lot of unnecessary MRIs are conducted every year in hospitals around the country. Part of our job here is to, and all of the agencies, is to make sure if we're going to do an MRI out there that it's actually necessary. If we can determine, just like a doctor, mm -hmm. if a doctor can determine enough by an x-ray, they don't need to do an MRI. Just because we have the equipment and the money doesn't mean we absolutely have to have an MRI. So I guess the question here is, if you didn't have a statutory, would you want to do this project? 
if you didn't have to, would you would you want to do this? I, is this important to the company to do this absent any sort of legal mandate? I, I'm the former executive director of the state ethics agency, so I'm going to give you a very straight answer. Prior to the mandate that we had, we were, and during the advocacy on that bill, PG&E's position was, this is not necessary. In large part, though, because of the Franciscan formation, the particular type of rock we have off coast there, and we believed, our seismologists believed, that this was not, this technology would not uh, image well, or those rock formations would not image well using this technology. We've since learned, using low energy 3D, that they do actually image quite well. So I think our seismology, uh, geosciences team is what we call them, they have kind of come about a different understanding and they believe this will uh, glean additional information that they believe is absolutely crucial. And again, that goes to you don't really know until you know the answer, right? Until you have the results of the studies, if the answer is you're beyond your design basis, this plant was not built sufficiently to withstand the highest magnitude earthquake you could have, or ground motion rather, um, then the answer would certainly be yes, we should, we need to do these studies. You don't know until you get to the answer. Well, I appreciate that. Did, and here's, here's a question, and, and don't, don't feel the need to answer it until, uh, later if you, if you need to, but I guess I'm wondering, um, given all of the questions and that have been raised about federal and state permits and so forth, and the potential impact of the project, uh, is this something you need to start this year? Is there a compelling reason that we need to do it in 2012, or should we, should PG&E voluntarily ask to delay the project until we can get some of that. Give us another year to get the answers to some of these questions. An absolutely fair question, and one that came up at the State Lands Commission. So, so I will answer it because it's not a case of first impression, of course. Um, as you know, we were pushing to try to do all of the work this year, period. Um, at State Lands, and, and NRDC came in and said, we'd really like you to phase this over two years. It'll reduce the impacts. And you can determine after the first year if it's really necessary, if it's working, if the technology shows you what you want, those kinds of things. Essentially, because of the federal permitting required, we were not going to be allowed the potential to take, not to say we're going to have to take, but the levels of harassment that we were going to have in a single year. So we were forced into a two-year scenario anyway. That now means that it would be a three-year scenario. If we, go, if we delay to next year, we would certainly have to make, do it over those following two years, 2013 and 2014. You are bumping up then against a deadline for the um, NRC, something called seismic, Senior Seismic Hazard Assessment. Um, committee, they, they uh, promulgated some standards for how you assess seismic threat at nuclear plants, and they would like to have this information. I won't tell you that it's due and they won't consider it after the date, but they would like to have this information by January, I believe it is, of 2015. So it really puts us on a very tight timeline. Keep in mind also, it's not just the ships doing the work out in the water, it's then analyzing the data, and there is a substantial amount of time required. Uh, Fugro and some other contractors and, and some of the universities that we're uh, working with, Scripps and others, to analyze the data. So beyond the timeline for the ships in the water, there's an, an additional year. I've heard as much as two years because of things that are beyond me on in seismicity. Commissioner Rogers. Thank you, Mr. President. Mark. Um, a question for you. You mentioned the uh, a recent uh, event that you guys have conducted, or not you guys, but the same technology been, had been uh, protocol had been conducted off Washington. Could you describe that a little bit more in in several ways? One, in in terms of the intensity of sound that was projected right. into the, is it the same rolling, rippling, firing, where the, the same number of cannon, cannons, the same frequent, you know, well, the same duration of period of time? or some, whatever it is. Right. And also, could you describe, you said there was no observed effect. Could you describe the monitoring that was in place? Sure, I have a gentleman back to, in back of me who can go to monitoring, but I did ask him all these questions with regard to the rest. Um, Simon Poulter with uh, Padre Associates. Um, so this was conducted with using the same ship. Um, I, uh, he can answer whether it was the same array, the four streamer array, I'm not sure we know the answer to that, but um, Using the same decibel level, the roughly 250. 250. If you, yeah, if you look at the if you look at the document, I think it's in the range of 240. By the way, as you talk about that, that is the same range, and that's in the EIR, in the State Lands Commission's EIR, same range as the Bay Bridge project that was permitted for incidental take, not the scientific collecting permit approach of, you know, essentially uh, de minimis kind of approaches we're hoping for, but a uh, no intentional take approach, but otherwise allowed. 
So in terms of a sound source, this has been seen out there. I don't believe there's been any documentation that that project had massive fish kills, but that is the same level of take. So taking us back up to Washington now, um, this was just this spring, and uh, same ship using the same sound source didn't do the kind of what we'll call a lawnmower racetrack approach because they were doing more straight lines offshore. So I would say the, the intensity was not as great, not of the sound the source, but the overall intensity. period. The number of days was um, 17 total. Um, out of the two boxes we would seek to do this year, one is about 14 and one is about nine. So, you know, somewhere between those two. Um, and again, the, the impact was not seen. There was no take according to uh, the report back. Now the monitoring, I asked about the specific, in specificity about how did you observe there was no tick. Right, and let's see, I, I mean, on the federal level, I think we have all the same marine mammal monitors that were required. Um, yes, in regards to the Cascadia tour, I identify Simon Poulter with Padre Associates. I'm assisting PG&E on their permitting. Um, the Langseth did a tour, it's the Cascadia tour, um, Dr. Graham Kent, who has actually spoken um, before the State Lands Commission, was actually on board that as chief scientist. I've also spoken with Megan Cummings with Columbia University in regards to the marine mammal monitoring. Their big issue up there was resident killer whales, uh, much like our harbor porpoise issue. As part of that program, in addition to the five marine mammal monitors that are normally on the Langseth, they had an additional scout vessel. Uh, much like the same we're going to be doing, except we have two scout vessels, not just one, with additional marine mammal monitors on it. Um, there were no observed uh, impacts to that resident population. They also had, um, much like uh, off of seen off here, off the coast this year, a lot of humpback whales. I talked to Graham Kent. They actually had a gray whale or a humpback whale pass right underneath the vessel. Obviously, the sound source was completely shut down because they were in the exclusion zone. But um, the, the scientific report on that cruise is not out yet. They are required by their permit. It will actually provide all the information on that tour. But there were no observed um, takes as defined. Um, you know, obviously there was harassment associated with the standard procedures. But same vessel. I will actually correct Mark in that they actually use 6,600 cubic inch air guns, not the 33 that we were using. What does that do for DB? Uh, it does change it a little bit. Um, it's a bigger source because they were trying to penetrate deeper, but it does increase the sound source a little bit. Um, but n it's not incrementally larger just because it's So doubled. let me get this straight. So the monitoring was, it was directed entirely to marine mammals? Marine mammals and turtles, yes. Yeah. But so I did it confirm... Didn't, it didn't get into uh, fish? I did confirm with uh, Megan Cummins with Columbia University because she was directly on board. They did not observe any fish takes, any kills you at you all. You mean standing on the boat, they didn't observe any fish Ch takes? They had the chase boat as well, so they, they had no So there was observed. nothing in the water, there were no ROVs, no, nothing like that? Not in that situation. They, they were putting down ocean bottom seismometers on the seabed, okay. so they did have additional vessels out there. I, I think the key issue is she said if we had seen any kind of fish kills, you would expect to see seabirds attracted to it. Um, they were extensively watching for that and did not see that. Thank you. Now that stands very different from what I think the pro that you're describing. Absolutely. Aren't you, Mr. Brown? And I'm a little shocked to hear that Washington didn't have more like what we will have, but... I, I'm stunned, yeah. actually, yeah. like a fish. Uh, no, uh, what... So, how would you differentiate? I, I am a little stunned, actually. It's like those guys asleep up there or something? Anyway. Uh, in terms of differentiating, I only offer that as one of the bases for our saying, absolutely, we need to monitor this, we need to know. Um, but we're, what we have in terms of experiential data f in other places is that it's not going to have the level of impact that I think you were most concerned about. Yeah, and that's because, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, no one has done a study where you've got a fish in cages, larvae in bags, whatever, bam, 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 you do the protocol over the top of it, you dive it immediately, either ROV or, or uh, in suits, and you find out what happened. In other words, no one's done that, right? Am I right or wrong? No, that's absolutely right, and you also underscore something I've left out here, and we mentioned this last time, but these ships 
first the, sh the ship used here begins with a very low sound source and the mitigation guns that are used for when you're not otherwise firing the, right. the air cannons. They ramp up very slowly over about a half well, hour. That, that's to scare away the stuff that can go away. But Correct. in our world, which isn't just the marine mammal world, our guys don't go away. Well, that, that, they that can't. Is There's, they, they just don't know how to do that. Uh, are we talking about fish? fish? Don't know how to swim away yeah. from a large sound source? Uh, well, okay, one that's, that's, that's rippling yeah. and firing over thousands of iterations, I I you know, in a day. No, I don't think they do. Okay. Okay. Well, I don't know that. And I, and I don't either. Yeah. Please. Simon Poulter again. Um, unfortunately, State Lands is not still here, and I, I'm not going to put words into their mouth, but their EIR did conclude based on the literature that there would be no adverse impacts to, yeah. you know, fish. And mm -hmm. the studies that you've talked about have been done in both freshwater and in saltwater with caged animals next to very similar air guns. They have not seen these kind of kills that you're concerned about. Um, obviously, the, the dynamite and things like that that have been used historically have certainly had a history of fish kills because of the percussive, immediate nature of that. But um, with the air guns, the way they were designed, which in fact Columbia University was involved in, was, was specifically to avoid those types of impacts. So the literature is pretty clear that we are not going to see any kind of massive kill off or die off. Thank you. I have nothing else unless there are other questions. Okay. I would just right. rem remind that Mr. Rosen is here if you'd like to hear about the ROV survey. Um, and also, I, I will defer to you. I, we have a meeting at uh, 3 o'clock with the Coastal Commission, which I'm glad to miss. Um, or we have a representative we can leave here to answer questions if you have further questions for Pugini. Thank you. Okay. Chuck, did you, you look all right?